Good morning. The message today is a life to keep. It's from John 12, from verses 23 through 36. Reading through the text brought to mind a close friend who recently passed away. He and I played tennis every morning for well over 10 years in our 20s. His passing was most dramatic. They could ill afford it. The family went ahead and spent a small fortune anyway, keeping his kidneys alive by repeated dialysis and blood transfusions. Science today increasingly allows us to prolong life like that for years. And we do it even when it already looks frightfully like we're playing God ourselves. That we can do that makes Jesus' words in John 12 from 23 to 26 jarring, discordant. Where without much thought we would naturally say the one who can save life must save it. Jesus says he who loves his life must lose it to keep it to life eternal. The passage naturally breaks into three sections from Verses 23 to 26, a life empowered and enabled at great price. From verses 27 through 30, a life upheld and sustained by God. And from verses 31 to 36, a life grounded on the crucified Christ. Let's all stand to honor God's words as we read our text today together. John 12, from verses 23 to 36. 23, and Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Verse 27, Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. 31. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. Please be seated. Let's go to the first of the three sections that our text naturally breaks into. A life empowered and enabled at great price. In John 12, from verses 23 to 24, Jesus speaks primarily of himself and of his imminent death. Jesus means that he will soon die and that by means of his death, he will produce much life. That he cannot be the much-awaited savior of Israel without first dying. At the triumphal entry, those who hailed, hailed Jesus as King of Israel expected them to save now. That is what the word Hosanna means, literally. But what they failed to understand was that he could only save by giving up his life. 
But he could only do that by experiencing the death penalty for sin in our place. That it was not our Lord's coronation as King of Israel that would save many but his death. In verses 25 to 26, Jesus now extends that general principle to his followers. Anyone who strives to save his life will destroy it, he says. And anyone who despises his life in this world actually preserves it. He calls them and us with them to follow after him. And that meant that in time, they would be called to give up their lives as he did. And so they did and were honored by the Father. Why should we take these words seriously? They are so jarring, so out of touch, in light of what we can do today to preserve and to prolong life. They say we are to hate life and rather embrace death. And then enigmatically to connect all of that to self-sacrifice, a sacrifice that one would don't only naturally recoil from. Why then should we take this advice seriously? Let me offer you two two logical reasons. Firstly, the one who spoke these words did exactly as he advises. He did that himself. He gave up his life, and in such a way that you cannot simply dismiss this as foolish or frivolous. However you look at it, he was extraordinarily successful in accomplishing what he came to do. By giving his life up, as he advises here, clearly Jesus accomplished all that he wanted to accomplish and then strategically inspired all of his men to do the same. And we know they all went, each of them, to martyrs' deaths, but not before they had turned the world upside down. Acts 4, it tells us even the Jewish leaders who wanted to kill him began to sit up and to take notice. Acts 4, verse 4 to 13. They observed the confidence of Peter and John, understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed. They began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. A prominent atheist, now deceased, Christopher Hitchens, ironically he acknowledged this same thing when mockingly he said in a public debate, all this from a band of nobodies hailing from one of the most primitive parts of the civilized world. Really? He said. In John 12, verse 23, Jesus sets down a vitally important principle that a truly fruitful life comes not from one's efforts to preserve and save that life. Ironically, counterintuitively, it comes from one's willingness to sacrifice that life. To make sure that they all understood that, Jesus immediately illustrated the principle via a metaphor of, grain, of a grain of wheat. A grain of wheat which remains unfruitful as long as it is kept to itself, but which becomes remarkably fruitful when it's thrown to the ground and buried there. He goes to an agricultural image, enabling his audience to grasp the principle in their own everyday terms. And no doubt, they all immediately understood, having all come up from, from roots or from connections to agriculture. The point our Lord is making is really quite simple, even though we should bear in mind that they really did not understand the meaning of these words. They didn't really fully grasp them until after the cross. But here's the point. Really quite simple. One can preserve a grain of wheat, protecting it from the elements and from corruption, but by doing so, it will never produce a crop of wheat. On the other hand, one can place that same grain of wheat in the ground, causing it to die. And that death, the death of that seed will produce much fruit. Even in our day, where most of us are far, far removed from agriculture, that principle can be readily seen. An employee, for instance, who just puts in time to receive a paycheck, he's not worth much to his employer. On the other hand, another employee who gives of himself to his work, who seeks above all else to do a job well, to get it done on time and on spec, is invaluable to his employer. The family, too, offers us another application. If a father or mother lives only for themselves, the family suffers, and the children may eventually go astray. 
On the other hand, if they give of themselves, the family thrives, and the children, they become an honor to their parents and multiply their joy. Now, as true as all of this is in business and in family life, it is even more acutely true of spiritual things. Only when we say no to ourselves do we become capable of saying yes to God and thereby receive his fullest blessing. That is what Paul meant when he said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. He meant that he had died to self in order that he might live for God. Or again, he said in Galatians chapter 6, in verse 14, May I never boast except on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Think about this now. Think about this because far too many Christians today are quite content to go through life chugging along like a 1200cc 1955 Volkswagen Beetle. At one time or another, we've heard that we are all capable of doing much better. Ironically, we've even experienced the exhilaration, the spiritual and emotional high that comes from having God's explosive power go out as we venture out for Him to do something that we don't normally do. Well, the problem is that we can't seem to summon that power at will, those highs. And so we go back to the dreariness of chugging along in our Volkswagen Beetle. As the years go by, quickly it becomes a dim memory those few exciting times, those emotional highs. Well, the supreme irony is this. Jesus' death on the cross gave us keys to a spectacular muscle car. It empowered and enabled us, gave us a Gran Torino. All these years, we could have been driving that unbelievably powerful Gran Torino Super Sport. That same car that was feature, featured in that 2008 movie, hit movie by Clint Eastwood, very same muscle car that was featured in that iconic TV series in the 60s, Starsky and Hutch. We've all had it in us, waiting to be let out that supercharged engine, the Cobra Jet 429 cubic inch monster of an engine. And yet, all of our pathetic little lives, we've been chugging along in that pathetic 1200cc Volkswagen bug. How stupid is that? Letting out that muscle car, harnessing the explosively powered engine in us, is the simple message of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. How do we release the power? John 12, verse 25 tells us. Although unfortunately, the message is hidden away, locked from us, locked away from us in our, in our English translations. In John 12, verse 25, we read, The man who hates his life, he shall keep his life. Translation to English actually leaves much to be desired. As translated, there is no way of telling that different words are used for life in he who hates his life, and life in he shall keep his life. As translated, there's no way to see that those are two separate, entirely different words in the original language. And yet, that is the very beating heart of the metaphor. The man who loves his life. There, he uses the word psyche. It's a word that refers to the life of the mind. We call it the ego. It refers to the human personality that thinks, plans the future, charts its course. Jesus is saying that is what must die. In other words, the independent will of man must die. He must die to release the Gran Torino. And he shall keep his life. This time, he say, when he says that, he uses the word zoe. He's saying every Christian has this eternal this divine life. And he has it in its fullness only when his entire personality with all of its likes and desires is surrendered to Christ. Today there are many Christians who trivialize and flout God's laws. Many Christians disregard his instructions about the sanctity and the permanency of marriage, for instance. This probably explains why 
divorces among Christians stand at the same rates for those of non-Christians, at least in the West. Think about it. In countries where the statistics come from, that means those who present as Christians have even higher rates of divorce than pagans now. Higher because many non-Christians don't even bother to get married and therefore remain outside the numbers which these comparatives are based. And if we factor in those non-marrieds, why the real numbers emerge and will be shown to actually have higher rates of divorce than those who don't call themselves Christians. Many Christians today live just like those around them do. They're self-absorbed, their lives no less an expression of the eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die ethic that the pagan world around us lives by. And worst of all, many Christians today live as though the high moral standards demanded by the Bible, that they are just mere suggestions that can be ignored at will. And then they wonder why their lives are so barren and meaningless. This is why. It's because they have not died to their own desires in order that they might live for Christ. It's because they have not been crucified with Him. They have not obeyed Him. Jesus is their Savior, but He is not really the Lord of their lives. If this is true of you, this morning we encourage you to really learn this lesson. It is never pleasant to be crucified, but you will never really live in the true spiritual sense until you are so crucified. Consider, for instance, the incredible legacy of George Mueller. He lived in England generations ago, founded many great orphanages, setting them up, maintaining them, making his needs only known to God by prayer. He was extremely effective. And when asked about the secret of his effective service, this was his reply. There was a day when I died, died to George Mueller, died to his opinions, to his preferences, to his tastes and will, died to the world, its approval and censure, died to the approval and blame of my brethren and my friends, and since I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. To lose our lives in order to gain it unto life eternal does not mean we must do, all of us do, what George Mueller did, but it does mean that we are willing to do anything for Christ, even if, if he should so direct it. We must be willing. We've looked at the first section, a life delivered at great price. Now let's go to the middle section, a life upheld and sustained by God. Verses 27 to 28. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The word used for troubled, the word tarasso, is startling. Startling because it denotes revulsion, horror, anxiety, agitation. And if this were a mere man, we ought not be surprised. After all, what man is there who has not sometime been troubled or disquieted by something or another? But this is no mere man. This is the Son of God. This is the Christ. This is the one who stilled the raging waves of the Sea of Galilee, rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. Why are you so afraid? He said, you still have no faith? Mark chapter 4. This is the one who calmly walked through rampaging crowds, led by men deathly intent on killing him again and again. This is the same Christ who in a short while will instruct his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. John 14 verse 1. How can this be? How can, be, how can the one who turns to us to say, let your hearts not be troubled, now say of himself, my heart is troubled. It seems incongruous even inconsistent. But it is anything but that when we realize what it was that Christ was dreading. The Lord's agony here is evidently, evidently connected to the Greeks who were seeking an audience with him in verses 21 to 22 of our chapter. As he contemplated his reply to those Greeks, he began to speak of the necessity of his death to Philip and to Andrew in their behalf. 
And no doubt, Jesus rejoiced in the coming of the Greeks as precursors of a multitude of Gentiles soon to come. But too, that joyful thought leads to wrenching thoughts of the coming ordeal. An ordeal that meant separation from the Father. Clearly, it was, that physical, it was not physical death that he dreaded. It was that separation. Indeed, how can one who had never known one second of unbroken fellowship with his Father peacefully contemplate that? Mark 14, in verses 32 to 33, it left us in a gripping picture of how the cro- as the cross drew nearer and nearer, Jesus began to tremble and, and began to be troubled. They came, it says, to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And, it, and he took with them Peter, James, and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. That is what stands behind that phrase. My heart is troubled. We cannot plumb its depths, but when we see the death of Christ in these terms, we can at least begin to understand. But now there is something terribly important in all of this for us. Note that even in profound agony, Jesus shows still resolve. There is no hint of pulling back or changing course. He says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Of course not, he says. For this reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify my name, was his response. Did God glorify himself through Jesus? Indeed, he did. And don't miss that not only did he glorify his name, don't miss that the Father actually spoke from heaven to confirm that he had done so. Father, glorify your name. It drew a dramatic heavenly response. If you will, a ponderously dramatic, I second the motion. We mustn't miss the significance of that response. There are only three occasions, three occasions in the Gospels, where God spoke audibly to his son in the presence of men. At his baptism, all the three synoptic Gospels refer to that. At his transfiguration, again, all the three synoptic Gospels refer to that. And here is the third instance in John chapter 12. In the two previous declarations, it appears only a few people actually heard Jesus or or God the Father speaking. But this declaration in John is different. It was made in Jerusalem at the temple where a large crowd is gathered. Everyone seems to have heard the same words, even though not everyone heard them the same way. Those who rejected, why, they did what unbelieving men do, faced with the, with the miraculous, they explained it away in terms of natural phenomena. And so to them, the very voice of God was nothing more than thunder. Those who believe, or at least had not closed their minds, they seemed to have recognized some kind of heavenly speech, but they did not understand. It was mostly as if God had spoken in some other language. And so they concluded that an angel had spoken to Jesus. And here's the question to ask. Why would God speak to Jesus in a way that prevented anyone else from understanding what was said? All the more puzzling when we consider our Lord's words, where he says this voice has not come for my benefit, but for yours. Verse 30. Jesus says God has not spoken for his benefit primarily, but for theirs. After all, he did not need any reassurance of his Father's love and approval. But they, they needed to hear the Father's response to his words about the cross. But if they needed to hear it, why were they unable to understand? From other places, we are told Jesus was the Son of God, come down from the Father, who spoke for the Father. John 8, verses 26 to 28. Look at what it says. He who sent me is true. The things which I heard from him, I speak to the world. They did not realize he had been speaking to them about the Father. And so Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He, and I do nothing out of my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Jesus was the Logos, the Word. Hebrews puts it this way. In Hebrews 2, For this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the Word spoken through angels proved unalterable, 
and every transgression and disobedience receive the just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And note this, after it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. Did you catch that? Our Lord is God's spokesman. He speaks for God. You know, if we want to know what God has to say, we must listen to the Son of God who speaks for him. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Peter, James, and John heard from the Father earlier at the Transfiguration. While he was still speaking, it says, a bright cloud surrounded them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is the Son I love, in whom I have great delight. Listen to him. All three synoptic gospels tell us that. Peter, James, and John heard God declare Jesus to be his beloved son, and that because of this they'd better pay careful attention to his words. The father said, when my son speaks, you better listen. And that stands right squarely behind why we are here together as a church almost four years now. Is our soul ever troubled? Is it likely to be troubled in the days ahead? What are we to do in such circumstances? What are we to do when relatives die? When sickness strikes? When we lose our job? When enemies abuse us and friends fail to understand? What shall we do? Answer, we learn from the master whose soul was profoundly troubled. And in the midst of that, he prayed. In the midst of that profound agony, he said, Father, glorify your name. In other words, if I lose my health, glorify your name by my sickness. If I lose my wealth, glorify your name by my poverty. If I lose my good name, glorify your name by my humiliation. If I lose my life, glorify your name by my death, he says. What a prayer. He says, glorify your name. How blessed we will be if we too in the midst of profound trouble can say the same with confidence. Father, glorify your name. The difficulty we have with all of that is that we have this natural tendency to substitute my for your and to mean my name. Or at least my name and your name together. Sure, we want a God who's glorified but not at our expense, not, or in a way that we would not choose personally. This should be our prayer also. And if we have difficulty praying it, as we all do, think of the secret of the surrendered life that Paul, the Apostle Paul, offer, offers in Philippians 1. To me, to live is Christ, to die is gain, he said. Oh, may that all be true for all of us here. Because if it is, we'll be able to endure either joy or sorrow, sickness or health, bane or blessing. Now, let's go to the third and final section of our text. Verses 31 to 36. A life grounded on the crucified Christ. Verses 31 to 33. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. In this third and final section, we find Jesus in the shadow of the cross, summing up what his looming death brings in its wake. There's much profound theology in the text, and we ought not let any of it pass us by. Firstly, take note that there's a condition precedent for all of this. The condition is explicitly set for us in verse 32. If I am lifted up from the earth, well, I will, draw up all, I will draw all men to myself. And we need to ask, who is speaking? Who is the I of this statement? Answer, plainly and simply, the historical Jesus, the crucified Christ. Until quite recently, there was much asinine debate about the historicity of Jesus. Well, not anymore. In a televised debate between John Lennox and Richard Dawkins, Dawkins was forced to admit an earlier gaffe where he's seemingly calling this to question. Lennox very quickly reminded him that no historian of repute today questions the historicity of Jesus. And Dawkins, red-faced, had to take his disingenuous remark back and concede the point. That's exactly a picture of what he looked like when he did that. 
That's because archaeological evidence today keep coming up, pointing to the historical Jesus. Findings of wrist and foot bones with nails squarely in them are increasingly being brought up, attesting to the reality of the crucifixion of Christ recorded by Josephus, who was, mind you, an independent Jewish historian, an antagonist. And then two ossuaries today keep coming up with various artifacts that validate the gospel according to the, res according to the accounts of the resurrections in the gospel. So firstly, notice that this is not an imaginary Christ spoken here. He was not the Christ of men's imaginings, but the Christ of reality. The Christ of actual historic fact. Ruben Torrey writes of this text and he says, Take note that this is not the Christ of Mary Baker Eddy or of the Seventh-day Adventists' fancy. Not the self-styled Christs of many in our day. No, this is the historical crucified Christ. Secondly, I want you to take note that Jesus declared not just that he had to die to bring all this to pass. He stipulated how he was going to die. If I am lifted up from the earth, he says in verse 32. He tells us exactly how he had to die, that he would die lifted up. You all recall that such talk is not new in John's gospel. In the third chapter, in verses 14 to 15, it said... Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now thirdly, take note that the crowd around him clearly understood all of this, understood his words. But unable to accept the truth, they answered, we've heard out of the law. Heard, mind you. Not, they know the law. They heard out of the law from their leaders that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Verse 34. Not that there's a crowd. It says we have, it does not say we have read the, that the Messiah will remain forever. It says we have heard that the Messiah will remain forever. Clearly it's crunch time for this crowd. They must decide now who to, will they believe. Will they believe our Lord and what he says about himself as the Messiah? Or will they believe the Pharisees? They can't follow both the Pharisees and Jesus. They must choose one or the other. And right now, what the Pharisees teach about the Messiah is much more appealing than what Jesus is saying. And so the mood change is clear. It's even palpable. Already they, are no, lo they no longer herald Jesus as the Messiah King of the triumphal entry. The teaching of the Pharisees at this point is better because it appeals more to their fleshly desires and they all turn away. I read that and my immediate thought was no wonder all of the attempts to stone Jesus again and again failed. Our Lord's death had to be at the right time, at the Passover, done in the right way by crucifixion. Had to be done that way in order to fulfill all of those Old Testament prophecies and the purposes of God. And now finally, notice that Jesus spells out what comes next. Notice how he spells out how his death on the cross would bring judgment upon the evil world system. He says plainly, now judgment is upon this world and, upon the, and now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Clearly and plainly, not only would Christ's death bring judgment on the world, but at the same time, judgment would come for its wicked ruler, Satan. In his last public words, Jesus urges those in the crowd to walk in the light. He is the light. He is not going to be with them as the light much longer. And that when he is lifted up, the darkness will overtake him if they reject his light. Notice the obvious sense of urgency in his words. It's crunch time. It's now or never. We're told this in verse 36. This thing is Jesus spoke and he went away, hid himself from them from that point on. This is a most unexpected moment. Jesus had entered Jerusalem in the most public way possible via a triumphal entry. Every day he came, he performed miracles and taught. Now, there's nothing more to say. They have a choice to make. And Jesus goes into seclusion so that they can decide. One cannot escape the finality, the closure of these words. Jesus said, 
all that there is to say. Israel must now decide whether to believe the teaching of the Pharisees or the teaching of Jesus. They must put their faith in a suffering Savior or put their faith in a would-be military Messiah. From here on in, Jesus speaks only to his disciples or to those who try and arrest him and try him. There's an application for us, a church that seeks to be faithful only to his words here. We find it in verse 32, And if I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Clearly, the point is that the crucified Christ, it is the crucified Christ alone who draws human beings. The verse reveals the hapless condition of the men and women that we seek to reach are in. If they need to be drawn to Jesus, it follows that apart from his gracious and effective drawing, all are separated from him. And it says, they're not just separated by a small or insignificant separation. Not only are men and women separated from Christ, they are separated from him in such a deep and profound way that they will not come to him unless he draws them. In other words, their very will is captivated by the sin into which they have plunged themselves, one writer puts it. Christ is lifted up, but they will not return to him unless he draws them. Why must we make such an effort to win people and pray that God will bless our efforts and convert them? It is because they will not come without his intervention. People are drawn to Christ, not driven to him. Some, think people, some, some people think that they must be driven to him. Reacting many purpose to frighten people to flee to Christ in desperation. Still others go to the other extreme. They sell a slicked up Christ who doesn't demand much, not even repentance. But that's not what our text says, does it? It says all you need is the historical crucified Jesus. And if you're here, if you're new to all of this, then all you need to remember is this. All men and women come to a point where they are separated from Christ captivated by the sin into which they have plunged themselves. In that sorry state, men cannot and will not come to him of their own will. And yet he draws some to himself, saves them in spite of themselves to the praise of his glory. Will you come? Will you allow the crucified Christ to draw you? It doesn't matter who you are or what your background is. The text tells us Christ draws everyone. Why then should that be among those who are so drawn? And now a final closing thought for us to ponder. The final portrait that is painted, by, painted of the Savior in our passage is simply overwhelming. Jesus said to them, for a little while longer the light is with you. Uh, walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He says, he who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. The scripture declares, the scriptures all over declares, he is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. It says, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Second Peter chapter 3. The Lord, compassionate and gracious, Slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. Psalm 103, Exodus 34. Our reading this morning said much the same thing again and again. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 27. When they cried to you in the time of their distress, you heard from heaven according to your great compassion. You gave them deliverers. When they cried again to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you rescued them according to your compassion. You bore with them for many years. In your great compassion, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. For you are a gracious and compassionate God. Though human beings often lose control of our emotions, God never does. We've seen that again and again with these intractable people and their leaders. God could have rightfully destroyed them all. But instead, he patiently bears with them, extending to them again and again the hope of salvation. Even when any has been wronged, his patience remains infinitely perfect. Let us pray.
Father, thank you for your timeless words. Words that illuminate, words that inspire, that ground us as they comfort, they soothe and embolden. And now even in this quiet, deeply personal moments, speak, Lord Jesus. Speak to those of us who need to take you literally at your word. Those who need to step out and obey them even at great cost. Speak to those of us who cling to your words for dear life, trusting you and you alone as they walk through adversity, even life-threatening illness. Speak to those of us weighed down by anxiety, worry, who have trouble at work, who have trouble at home, who have children in trouble. Speak, Lord. Your people listen with all that is in them today. Speak to each of us now. Allow everyone to come away from here with hearts lilting, their spirits rejoicing. That is our prayer. Just want to remind everybody of a number of things coming up. First, uh, the Women of Grace uh, Bible study. Um, Tears and Fears from that series, Words for the Worried. This Friday, September 28th, at the McDonald's in Commerce Avenue. Then the Men of the Word Bible study this, Thursday, this coming Saturday, September 29th, um, at, also at McDonald's. I'd like to announce too that PDF 242 is launching a new series, a series on the seven churches of Revelations, um, an overview of the churches on October 4, on Thursday at the Jollibee, also on Commerce Avenue. Then we have the Youth and Young Adults Retreat, not of the world, living in a world of worldliness. October 31 to November 2 at CCT in Tagaytay. Let's pray. Whatever our respective meditations this morning, let us now bow our heads toward the Father. Father, according to the riches of your glory, strengthen each of us with power in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we may be rooted, grounded in love, that we may be able to comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, keep us all from the supreme folly of going against your words, or even of setting them aside knowingly or unknowingly. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.